Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 380 for the 13th of Kislev in Alibir. It's become quite popular, not only in religious circles, but in the world at large, maybe mostly the self-help world at large, to say things like, your thoughts create reality. If you think it, it will be it. You know, things like that. There's sort of like this awareness that our thoughts really are very powerful and that they actually can shape the world around us. There are numerous explanations and different angles that people can take on this thing. Often people talk about it in terms of like affirmations, that affirmations, the way affirmations work is they sort of focus your intention, attention on whatever it is that you're saying so that subconsciously you actually do behave in ways that align with your thoughts. Um, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like if you occupy yourself with certain ways of thinking, the most likely that's going to affect your practical life and, uh, and what it is that you do, uh, right? So this is part of the idea of, uh, of being really careful with our thoughts in Judaism and, and studying Torah too, that the more we study Torah and the more we try to think about holy things, the more likely these kind of things are going to be present in our lives that we'll, that we'll choose to occupy ourselves with these things practically in our lives. But today we're actually going to take this discussion to another level and we're going to talk about the power of thought and the power of thinking and learning specifically Torah to not just affect the physical reality around us down here, but to actually affect the spiritual reality, to actually affect the source from which our world comes from. And the angle through which the ultra is going to address this is by trying to understand why it is that we should learn impractical laws. So as mentioned, and as we've been learning for the past little while here in the Tanya, one of the reasons why it's so important to learn the the laws, the halachos of the Torah, uh, is because even if at the moment when you're learning those laws, you're not engaging in the laws, you're not, they're not practical for that moment. The more you learn the laws, the more, you know, the, the more you're sort of like setting your mindset in such a way so that it's it's like you're intending to keep these laws. So it's like if you learn the laws of Shabbos, for example, even if it's not Shabbos, you're sort of like setting an intention that you are going to keep Shabbos and this is how you're going to do it. And we extended this to even uh, laws that involve prohibitions, like learning what you're not allowed to do. So again, going with the Shabbos example, instead of, you know, just learning about how to do Kiddush, how to light Shabbos candles or whatever, you actually learn all the things you're not allowed to do on Shabbos. So even though that's sort of like an, an, in the negative, like you're learning what not to do, there's still a practical component to it. You're learning what not to do practically, what you will not do on Shabbos. But what about those laws, which there exist many of these in the Torah, that are extremely impractical, that are that are very, we can think of them almost to the point of being theoretical, like they're never going to apply to your life. They most likely maybe even never even apply to anybody's life, which believe it or not, there, there are certain laws like this that exist. One example that the Ultra Rabbit brings is this, um, is the laws, laws of Pigol which I'm personally not super versed in laws of people, but my understanding is it has to do with a certain intention or lack of intention or inappropriate intention that one might have had um, in bringing a sacrifice in the base of Mekdash. And the laws are so intricate and so detailed that it's, it's, it's for all intents and purposes, it, it didn't really happen. But yet there are these extensive laws regarding people. So why do we need to learn about this? This is, these aren't practical at our, all for our lives. And we're not even preparing for something practical. 
practical. So this is the question that the altar is going to uh, to address today. And in short, the basic answer that he's going to give is because just because something doesn't exist in our physical reality and may never exist in our physical reality, uh, it has a spiritual existence that by virtue of the fact that it's in the Torah tells us that there's a spiritual reality to it because everything in the Torah is a reflection of God's mind. And so if something exists in God's mind, that means it exists on some level. And so when we think about the fact that when we do practical mitzvahs down here, when we actually perform mitzvahs down here, we spoke about that the purpose of doing these mitzvahs is in order to to rectify and separate and the the fallen sparks that exist down here in this world. So believe it or not, there's a certain there's a similar type of thing. Uh, Thing at play in the spiritual realities where yes of course god is good and totally good and you know how could we say that there's anything that needs rectification on that level but nevertheless as we'll see on some level there there is this concept of klipos there is this concept of the husks that conceal godliness even in the spiritual realms at least during this time that we're living in exile and these laws, these more theoretical abstract laws are a reflection of this. And that by learning these laws, what we're actually doing is we're separating these, uh, these klipos from the spiritual source, source from which they suckle from, because we know that all klipos, all negativity has to, can only subsist by suckling, by getting its vitality from holiness. And so when we learn these laws, what we're doing is we're we're, uh, we're causing this separation, we're causing this detachment of any negativity that might be found in those laws, even on a theoretical level, from its source. And ultimately, as we'll see in, in the times of Mashiach, what's going to happen is that um, these laws are actually going to be, the study of these laws are actually going to cause them to elevate back to their ultimate source, which is in a place of total holiness, of no klipas at all, of, of just pure... Um, goodness, which is the sort of every source of everything. So with that being said, so let's see how the Altar Rebbe explains all of this. And for context, we're learning a new essay today in Kuntrus Ahran, and we're going to learn the entirety of the essay. This is essay five of Kuntrus Ahran. And this essay really does follow the previous essay, which is this very long essay that we've been learning the past week or so of essay four, which has been talking about the power of mitzvahs versus intention versus learning Torah and all of this stuff. And, and we concluded essay four by talking about this whole idea of studying Torah and the power of studying Torah. So today, as mentioned in the introduction, the Altar of it begins by talking about, uh, he says, we're going to try to understand the power. What, what, um, why is it, what's the applicability of studying laws that are totally impractical, that never actually happen? And maybe they never actually happened. They were never applicable. And for sure, definitely, they won't happen in the times of Mashiach, because in the times of Mashiach, we know that we're not going, nobody's going to be doing anything that's against the Torah. So if there's like a prohibition, like, for example, we have like Pigol, which we spoke about, that law that has to do with um, the, having the proper intention. Um, we're not going to have any improper intentions in the times of Mashiach. So if it's not applicable to us now, and if it was never applicable to us in the past, and it won't be applicable to us in the future, why do we need to study these laws? What's the good of studying these laws? So the Altar says, we have to understand the source of any prohibition that exists down here in this world. And he says that every prohibition in this world has a source above. And that source above is is from the klipos, from these spiritual husks that conceal godliness. Um, how is this so? Because everything here in this world must have a spiritual source above. It's that's that's just how it works. There can't be something down here that doesn't have a spiritual counterpart and a spiritual source which gives it vitality. So thus, if we see, if we're opening up a Gemara and we're learning about the laws of Pigol down here in this world, that means that that law, those laws, have a spiritual source above, and even says the ultra rabbit, this is true, even with like the smallest details of different kinds of prohibitions. The he gives a very interesting example. He gives an example of a man who plays with his hair. 
So there's this idea that, you know, women are definitely supposed to beautify themselves and be very vain. And that's, that's normal for a woman. And, and it's actually encouraged to a certain extent, um, to take care of your appearance for a man. Well, a man's supposed to be presentable. He's not supposed to be vain. He's not supposed to play with his hair and get into like different hairstyles and stuff like that. And so if a man does this, then at that moment, he's actually receiving vitality from the clipos that this is explained in the Zohar. The Zohar gives this example. So if even such a small example, like such a like trivial seemingly example like this, it's like in that case, that person, that uh, action is receiving its vitality of the Nklubos, then, uh, then definitely ever all the details of all the prohibitions, even if they're never going to happen in actuality in this physical world, nevertheless, their source is in the clipos above. Okay. Now what about, here's another example the ultra says, what, what about, um, mistakes? You know, let's say somebody makes a mistake or somebody does something unintentionally. An example he gives is let's say if somebody's counting out their sheep, um, you know, and there's this idea of, of, uh, that you were supposed to contribute the 10th sheep, the, what's known as the miser, right? So let's say you're counting out your sheep to see which one's the 10th and you call the ninth one, your 10th. Um, so nobody would really want to do that. Like that's not in your, uh, in your interest to do that because if you're counting out the ninth sheep, sheep as the 10th, then you, you're going to, if you end up doing this with every, you know, um, with, with your sheep, then you're going to end up giving more away than you would have wanted to. So it's obviously a mistake in this case. And so the ultra Rabbi says, it doesn't really make sense that this mistake would be coming from Klipos and it's possible, possibly they, it doesn't come from Klipos. Uh, now here there's a little insert, um, from the Tzemach Tzedek, who, who honed in on that word possibly. And he said that this word possibly implies uncertainty, uncertainty, because uh, he says that in fact, these, um, these uncertain things like mistakes people make by accident actually do come, come from Noga. So thus, uh, it could be that they're coming from the Klipos, but they're specifically coming from Klipos Noga which as we've learned, Klipos Noga are, are the translucent husks. So they're not as like intense or severe as the more opaque Klipos, uh, Shalosh Klipos Atmeos, the three impure Klipos, but yet it still is a type of Klipos. So there, there's this opinion that the Tzemach Tzedek brings out that perhaps on some level, making a mistake still has a Klipa source to it on some level. But then going back into the text, the Ultra Rabbi says that even if we say that it doesn't actually come from a Klipa source, let's say these mistakes, a person makes a mistake, it's even if it doesn't come from Klipa, then still this idea of making a distinction between uh, what is holy and between what is not holy, this way of thinking is sourced in the supernal chachma, in the supernal wisdom that, that came, um, that came down into the Torah on Mount Sinai when we received the Torah. So meaning to say, and this lines up with a, with a very famous te teaching that's, uh, that comes from the Gemara in Masachat Megillah chapter 19b, where it says, ma shekol that anything that any any seasoned student is going to teach was actually taught to Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai. So there's there's this basic idea that um, just to explain that there's this basic idea that anything that we learn, any any um, any even new quote unquote new aspects of Torah that gets revealed that get, that comes out. So let's say there's like a new kind of technology, and then a, a Rabbanim come and they pask and they give their, the, the, they give, they give us statements of law of like what we need to do with this technology. Are you allowed to use it on Shabbos? Are you not allowed to use it on Shabbos? Are you allowed to use it at all? Well, you know, what is it? You know, let's say we clone meat. Is that cloned meat considered fleshek? Um, can you eat it with milk? Can you not eat it with milk? All these things that, you know, that they're all like very new things. Um, so how could we say that these things existed at the time of Mount Sinai, that they're actually part of the same Torah that we received at Mount Sinai? So the, the answer is that they are. They actually are part of the same Torah we received at Mount Sinai. It's just that the Torah we received on Mount Sinai was sort of like the like code. It was sort of like the like tools that gave that God gave us to be able to then interpret them and use them to understand how they apply to circumstances that will arise, any circumstance that will arise throughout history. So the basic idea that the ultra is bringing out here is that uh, basically that every single situation like that could possibly be of, uh, of even like a prohibition and even 
even a mistaken kind of prohibition, like where you do something by accident, even if nobody would ever do this accidental thing, the fact that it could exist in theory, that there's like a theoretical possibility of something like this existing, it means that it existed in God, or that it exists rather in God's supernal chachma, that it existed and that exists in the supernal chachma, which is the source of the Torah, which, which came down to us on Har Sinai. And, um, the altar Rabbi says that this extends to uh, all the detailed questions that Rabbi Yermia, Yermia had. So there's this whole thing in uh, in the Gemara and Bava Basra, page 23b, that Rav, Rabbi Yermia had all kinds of different questions, like so many different questions, to the point that he was actually kicked out of, of the yeshiva because of all his questions. And um, another example that the altar Rabbi brings is this whole discussion in Hulit. Hulin in chapter four of Hulin, where it talks about this idea of like, can, is an animal considered to be a firstborn if the mother's womb was opened before? Um, you know, and there was different ways that that could happen. So basically, there's just like, there's a lot of obscure, very, very obscure laws in the, in the Torah that do not appear to be very practical and perhaps they are not practical at all. Nevertheless, the altar is saying that they all are sourced in the supernal wisdom of God. And that every single law that is found in the Torah serves as a very specific type of gate. And just, this is my note here. I think it's interesting to look at the word gate in Hebrew uh, that's used. The word is sha'ar, which is also related to the word se'ar, which is hair. So it's like sort of like these different hairs, like the hairs can th be thought of as like spiritual energies also. So um, the spiritual energy emanating out of the head, out of the supernal chokhmah, uh, each one, so every single halacha is like a different spiritual energy that's emanating out from God's wisdom, from the supernal wisdom of God. And in Kabbalistic terminology, then we can think of this in terms of yesad brata, um, meaning founded the daughter, meaning to say that it's like there's this idea of abba yesad brata, that the father gave birth to the daughter. So what does this mean in uh, spiritual Kabbalistic terminology is that the chachma, the supernal wisdom, gives birth to the Malchus, which as we've learned in the Tanya, Malchus is like sort of the channel through which all of creation happens, through everything happens. So starting with Malchus of Etzilis, but then it goes down further and it becomes vested in the lower worlds of Bria, Yetira, and fin finally Asiya, which is our world. And okay, so we know that this Chochmah is, which then eventually comes down into Malchus, is responsible for the entirety of our reality. And it's the spiritual origins of all of our reality. Now, we also know that the Klipos, they receive their vitality from the Achoraim, from the backside of the 10 sp spheros of holiness. So it's interesting to think that these 10 spheros, the 10 spheros, which are like the energies that, you know, that, that, uh, that are made up of, that, that encompass all of all worlds, while they are godly spiritual energies, they actually have counterparts to them. They have like a, a backside to them. And that backside is where the Klipos receive the vitality because the Klipos need, they don't have any vitality of their own. They need to suckle vitality from something holy, from something spiritual. So the best they can get is like the, the backside of these, these spheres. It's sort of like, you know, let's say, you know, you have like a, a homeless person who can't afford food. The best they can do is go to the back of the restaurant and just get the scraps at the back of the restaurant. That's like sort of how these Klipos are. If you want to visualize it kind of. Um, and so, to be specific, where do these Klipos suckle from? They Klipos suckle, they, they suckle from the 10 spheros of Briae Tiranesia. So, so not Atsilis really, but really Briae Tiranesia. And to be really specific, most mostly, mainly from Yetira and Asia, which are the two lower worlds, because within the two lower worlds, these are the ones where uh, they're actually in an admixture of good and bad. There's there's a mix of klipos that are found within that world. So it's easier for them to suckle from that. And the way that they suckle is by way of like garments, which these lower and lower worlds are like more garments like, like they're, they conceal more godliness. So it makes more sense that the klipos would suckle from them. Okay. So now what happens what, with all of this in mind of like, okay, so the, so the, all of the laws and everything, they all derive from God's supernal chachma and they all have a spiritual source to them, even if, um, 
even if they don't manifest down here in a practical way. So thus, when we learn these halachas down here with, with Dibur and Machshava, with our speech and with our, with our thought, what happens is that we actually are able to separate these klipos from the holiness. So it's like we take away the suckling and we separate them. Um, and uh, as is explained, this is stated in the Sikunim and the Ram Ahemna, which are Kabbalistic Svarim, where it says to separate. It actually says that we're separating them. And through understanding this, we, actually, we can actually now understand a, a very famous teaching that's found in the Gemara, in Masechet in the Darim, page 81a. So there in the Gemara, there's an answer to the question that Yermiahu had, asking why his the land of Israel was destroyed at that time. Uh, in Yermiahu chapter 9, verse 11, and so the uh, Masechet Cholin, the answer they give, why was the land destroyed? The reason why the land was destroyed is because people at that time did not say Berkasa Torah. They didn't say the blessing over the Torah. So in the morning, um, what, what we say when we wake up in the morning, before studying any Torah, there's actually a, a blessing that you're supposed to say, which then after saying that blessing, then now you're allowed to study Torah. You're actually not really allowed to study Torah before saying that blessing. So it's an interesting thing. Like, why is it? You would think like, you know, isn't the main thing studying Torah? Like, what's so important about saying that blessing? Okay, I forgot to say the blessing. I neglected to say it. What's the big deal? For that, the land was destroyed. Um, so we can understand this now. Now that we understand that what it is that our Torah study accomplishes is because the whole point of studying Torah now from this perspective uh, of which we can understand specifically through learning about the impractical laws is we're attaching these laws back to their source in holiness, back to their source in God and godliness. So if we don't say the Birchas Torah, it's sort of like the Birchas Torah is this like pr proclamation that we're doing all, the, all of this for God. We're not just learning Torah for an intellectual pursuit. We're doing this for God. So if we don't have that, that, um, that bracha there, then, w then it's it's it kind of takes that away. It takes away that accomplishment. That what what that does. Now, another interesting thing about this word bracha or blessing is that it comes from the root berech. Berech means a knee. A knee is something that like it folds your, you know, when you bend your knees, when you squat down, you're drawing yourself down to the ground. So there's this general idea with brachos that kind of gives like a very deeper understanding and meaning to the brachos that we say is that we're drawing down spiritual energy into our world, drawing down godly energy into our world. So, uh, so what is it when we're learning these laws? So on the one hand, even if they're like these very impractical laws, we said that we're attaching to their source. We're attaching them back to their source and we're separating the klipos out from their source in the supernal chokhmah. And then what happens then is that we actually draw down the supernal chokhmah so that this supernal chokhmah can then go and can rectify uh, this, uh, this, uh, these, these laws, can rectify this spiritual energy that's happening there. And so this is why it's very important to say a bracha before we learn Torah, because saying the bracha is kind of like, first of all, we're acknowledging God and we're acknowledging that this is a godly endeavor. It's not just an intellectual endeavor. And secondly, that bracha itself, it, it instigates this drawing down process. Now here, the ultra rabbi gets into a really interesting idea that we've spoken about this before, that we all have a supernal self. So in Kabbalah, the supernal self is called the diukna. And the diukna is like the, the likeness of, of man, it's called. So each one of us has this. We have this like supernal, this higher self, we can call it. And so what happens is anytime we do anything down here, th this causes a mirror reflection in our higher self above that the higher self does something similar above. So the drawing down of this supernal wisdom, this is done by our higher self, but it's instigated through us, through down here. So when we study Torah down here, we instigate, we stimulate our higher self to draw down the supernal chokmah from above um, and to clarify these halachas up there. And this happens through the higher self, which is sourced in the nukva of Zer Anpin of Brei Tiranesia. So it's sourced in the malchus, nukva and malchus are synonymous, of the Zer Anpin. So the malchus aspect of Zer Anpin um, in these worlds of Brei Tiranesia. And so now, understanding all of this, we can now understand why it is so important that every single ruch, nefesh ruch and neshama, every single Jew, and not only Jew, but every single aspect of our souls, because these three aspects of our souls, Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshama, it's so important to, for every 
every soul to do all of the 613 mitzvahs in machshava dibur and maisei and thought, speech, and action in all of the deta- their details to the point that we actually need to reincarnate every single time in order to complete these things and, and in order to complete the um, the Torah in all of its levels and the levels of Pshat, Ramaz, Drash, and Sud, the simple meaning, the uh, hinted at meanings, the more homiletical meanings, and the secrets, the Kabbalistic aspects of the Torah. Why? Because through doing this, this is how we, we rectify the particular sparks of the 288 fallen sparks that pertain to their, that person's soul. So there's this idea that every single one of us, like there's the 288 fallen sparks and all the different aspects of those fallen sparks. And, uh, and each one of us, some of those sparks pertain specifically to us and are, are very um, apropos to us and to our lives both in a general sense and also in all their details. So this is why it's so important for us to be involved in Torah study because through Torah study, even if we're learning about these impractical laws, these impractical laws are related to, they have spiritual sources, which could be related to these different sparks. Okay, so now the altar is going to conclude on a very interesting point where, well, all of this might make sense during our times, during the time of exile, but what about in the future? What about the future times and the time to come? when we won't need to rectify anything anymore. All the rectification has happened. And doing and and when we um are are keeping Torah is going to be really just focused on doing good. We're not going to be focused on abstaining from evil. We won't have the temptation to do evil anymore. We're just going to want to do good all the time. It's going to be once the way I heard it be explained to me is like now we have this struggle between doing good and bad in the future it's going to be between doing good and better (laughs) like how much better can like good and great you know um so in the future so so at that point you could think to yourself okay so then maybe we don't need to study these prohibitions anymore and especially not these like really impractical prohibitions so do we need to do it we we still will actually have to why because then the purpose is actually going to be different the purpose is no longer going to be about rectification but it's actually going to be about elevating these levels of the souls the nefesh ruach and neshama higher and higher to the infinite level to the level of the ainsof and this is actually going to be true also for the prohibitions. So it's very interesting what he says here. He says that the prohibitions, these 365 negative commandments that we have, we've been talking about how they have this root in the klipos, right? But the ultimate root of them is actually in the gvuras, is actually in the severities, these higher severities. And But the truth is these higher severities, as is explained in, in Hasidus elsewhere, they are sourced in a holy place as well. Like in the spiritual, like on a certain level in spirituality, there's this divide between the the hey chasadim and the hey gvuros, the five kindnesses and the five um, severities, like the right side, the left side, that kind of thing. But in, in their source, ultimately, they actually both come from the higher source. We spoke about this in a previous episode where we talked about this idea of the... Um, the lavnit of the skull, like the um, the white of of the skull, that that's that's like the highest, the higher source where they merge, where the the right and left merge. And so, what will happen is that um, when we're learning these prohibitions in the future era, we're actually going to be sweetening these gvuras. It's called. We're going to be sweetening them with the kindnesses, uh, with the so the three hundred and sixty five prohibitions are going to be sweetened with the two hundred and forty eight positive commandments, and they'll become encompassed within them. And so thus we see that the entire Torah is eternal. It's not just for the exile. It's not just for the future. It's for always. It's, 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 it's applicable to all times. And we see that these 365 prohibitions are different branches of these, these, the Torah's general statements. It's all part of the same Torah. And they all have what, all of these prohibitions have a source in the Hague Vrus of holiness, which the way that we can think about it, this is a very interesting idea, is that we can think of it as as, as the aspect of blood that uh, vivifies all of the organs. So blood is red, right? So red is associated with gvora. It's associated with this attribute of severity. But at the same time, blood actually vivifies all the organs of the uh, vessels of Zer Anpin. So that's that's where the 365 prohibitions in our highest source they're coming from this holy place so that's it for today um so that was the whole essay of essay five of Kuntras Achron and um and so you know basically hopefully that gave you a little bit more of an understanding as to why it is so powerful and important to learn these impractical laws and that 
it's all practical in a certain sense because it's all accomplishing something. So keep learning Torah. And with that being said, we'll continue tomorrow when we move into essay six and I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.